So again, while this is getting pulled up, my name is Anthony Hawkins. Um, today we'll be talking about stress ulcer prophylaxis. Um, certainly appreciate the organizing committee for inviting me to entertain you guys for a few minutes. Where are you from, Anthony? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Gabe. Um, so I am faculty with the University of Georgia, and I am stationed on the Southwest campus in Albany. Um, and I practice at Phoebe Putney. There you go. There's everything. Um, all right, now we're going. All right, so the objective for the next few minutes um, is for you guys to be able to have an evidence-based conversation with someone um, to answer the question about GI prophylaxis, whether you should or should not do it. Now, this is a picture that I took from my cell phone, several pictures in here. Um, of Deborah Cook giving a talk at the annual congress at SCCM this year in Phoenix. And it tells you two important things. One, despite how antiquated this topic is, it is still being talked about um, on international platforms. And B, people are actually showing up to still hear about it. So I appreciate you guys for following suit. So 1994, Deborah Cook's original study came out identifying independent risk factors for um, clinically important bleeding in ICU patients. Now, to put that in perspective, this was me in 1994, right? And what they showed was that two independent risk factors came out, being respiratory failure, somebody receiving mechanical ventilation for at least 48 hours, or a coagulopathy defined, defined as having platelet count less than 50,000, or a non-drug-induced PTT over two, and a half to, or over two times baseline, or a non-drug-induced INR that's above 1.5. So just a few years later, 1999, we got the vanilla ice of guidelines, right? So it's a one-hit wonder. This is the first and only time it's ever came out. And again, just to put it in perspective, this was me in 1999. <laughs> and we haven't heard anything from them since then. So as you can imagine, we don't really know much. So fast forward just a few years, and Rob McLaren just gave a talk at a pharmacy conference back in October. And less about what he said was more about his disclosure was that he is on the task force for stress ulcer prophylaxis guidelines. And that task force had dissolved, right? Which made me believe the next time I can get up here and tell you guys about this, I'm gonna look, I'm gonna look more like Anthony Hopkins than Anthony Hawkins. Fortunately enough, um, I did find, I was scrolling through the agenda for Congress and I found that it turns out they have precipitated again. Um, and they did have a task force meeting in, in Phoenix, so that should be promising to some of us. So as with any 20-year relationship or lack of communication thereof with a guideline that was published back in 1998, you can expect lots of controversy and conflict, whether that be between practitioners and providers or even among large international organizations that are trying to write new guidelines or make recommendations within those. The first controversy or conflict that we are probably most familiar with is that comparing the two different drugs for prophylaxis, um, those being PPIs and H2 receptor blockers. Now we can talk for a whole hour about these drugs and the differences between the two and the safety and efficacy profiles, um, or we can at least look to what other guidelines have interpreted in terms of the data. So you see our surgical colleagues, and this is in chronological order, in 2008 they showed no preference um, in terms of agents. The Danish Society in 2014 actually show preference to PPIs, and the surviving sepsis guidelines have actually adapted their recommendation over um, the various renditions of the guidelines, and most recently, they show no um, preference to either agent. But when you look at the studies that they've cited, there's infinite numbers of meta-analyses, and you could go today and make your own conclusions, you can go in three more days and make a different conclusion. All of these people writing recommendations are simply looking at the same data and drawing different conclusions from that. What we can pretty safely conclude is that the incidence of clinically significant bleeding has infinitely dropped off from years past. Now there's a few things that we're going to talk about. One being that we have significantly changed our prophylaxis strategies, being no prophylaxis to prophylaxis to now even better agents for prophylaxis. And we've also probably argued, and maybe we'll hear from my colleagues soon, um, about interim nutrition practice. Maybe we're better at feeding our patients in the ICU, which has an impact. Um, so we know that, we know that the, the drugs have been compared, um, but maybe the question is less about which drug is preferred and more about which drug acts is preferred in different situations, right? So we can probably all agree that these two different agents will work differently, potentially, in different environments where one may be superior in one environment 
and less adequate in a different environment. However, the, another controversy that comes up now, we're going to put another contender in the ring, and it's going to ask us a more fundamental question in that who should get prophylaxis? So again, going through three different sets of guidelines, um, the, the surgery of trauma guidelines, they have it broken down by indication, um, risk factors that patients have by the level of evidence supporting it. Um, the surviving sepsis guidelines don't really do us any justice. They say, if you have sepsis or shock and you have risk factors, then prophylax them. That's perfect. Uh, and then the Danish Society in 2014 came out with the most bold recommendation and said, we recommend against stress ulcer prophylaxis in the ICU setting outside of the context of clinical trials. And they derived that from one meta-analysis, trial sequential analysis, which, again, depends on your perspective when you read it. Um, but they made some pretty bold recommendations to say that we basically do not have enough evidence to support that drugs prevent stress ulcers. Since then, we've had two other randomized trials, the pop-up trial and then um, the pilot study for what will soon become the revised trial um, that looked at PPIs versus placebo, some with or without requiring enteral nutrition. And basically can, um, consistently showed that no patient in either study in either treatment arm had a clinically significant bleed. So our bleeding has significantly absolved, um, but the, the drug was more likely to, um, people in the placebo group were still likely to have overt bleeding, but because of such small patient numbers, you were unable to uh, see a significant difference. We do have a couple trials upcoming, Peptic, um, SUP-ICU, and PPI-EN. Um, they are similar format. They're comparing PPIs to placebo. And even if PPIs went out, I still think based on the data um, between the two drugs, it still leaves the question unanswered about which drug is preferred. So in conclusion, I, I'm confident that not all ICU patients need stress ulcer prophylaxis. I'm still not real sure which ones do, but it's significantly less than we currently prophylax. Um, the controversy will continue to remain um, in terms of the, the two different pharmacologic agents. You should absolutely feed your ICU patients when you can. Um, and if you follow through with some of these things and only um, provide prophylaxis, there's potential for cost savings. And so with that, I understand we won't do questions, but I appreciate your attention.